This is a University of Otago podcast. Good evening. Um, my name is Harleen Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And it brings me great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture. As always, it's fantastic to look around the room and see academic and professional staff from throughout the university as well as students. And it's always particularly pleasing to see members of the general public who come along and join in in these inaugural professorial lectures. I'd also like to extend a special welcome um, to Paul's family who is here to support him this evening. His mum, Anne Brunton, and his sister, Caroline, who traveled here from the UK to be with Paul on this particularly auspicious occasion. And I understand that neither of them have ever heard him speak in public. So this will be a fantastic opportunity for them to hear him at his very best. And I would also like to warmly welcome Paul's partner, um, Ian Crabtree, who is also here this evening, making this a truly family affair. Now, sometimes at these IPLs, we come together to welcome um, someone from outside our um, Otago family into the family at the University of Otago. So on the one hand, we're here to celebrate um, promotions for people from within, but from time to time, we are also here to welcome someone who is joining our fold. And this is certainly the case this evening where um, we are welcoming Professor Paul Brunton, who was a professor long before he came to the University of Otago. But late in 2014, he joined the University of Otago as the dean of the dental school um, following the retirement of Professor Greg Seymour. Now, I knew at the time that we hired Paul that he was going to be great for this particular job. Um, he was chosen because he had an international research reputation, because he is an outstanding clinician and teacher, and because he is a strong and gifted leader. But to be honest, I didn't really realize how fantastic Paul was going to be until he actually arrived here on campus. And once I had the opportunity to spend more time with him and to work with him directly, I soon came to realize how truly fortunate we are here at the University of Otago to have attracted Paul into this particular role. Now, as many of you in this audience are very well aware, the university has recently initiated the most ambitious building program in this university's 147-year history. And among our current projects is the single most expensive and most complicated project we have ever embarked on. And that is our new dental school, which includes a fully functioning dental hospital. Now, Paul's vision and leadership has been invaluable in this project and his calm, considerate, and well-informed approach to all things regarding the dental school gives me great confidence that we are all making the right decisions. So Paul, on behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to officially welcome you, almost two years down the track, um, to your position of dean. I have already enjoyed working with you, and I certainly know that everyone in this audience will continue to cheer for you and for your staff as you continue to build on the reputation for excellence that is already so well-deserved by the dental school, um, not only for its research, but also for its teaching and for its outstanding patient care. We are also delighted that you have decided to come and join our University of Otago family, and we are pleased that both you and Ian um, are here with us this evening. And on behalf of the um, University, Ian, I just want to let you know um, that at the University of Otago, we believe that two dogs are always better than one. We understand that the Paul and Ian family are contemplating adding a pet to their family, and there's some debate about how many pets there should be. So, when in doubt, always shoot for the higher number. I will now call on the PVC of Health Sciences, um, Professor Peter Crampton, to tell us just a little bit more about Paul's journey to the University of Otago. Uh, thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor Tenakoto Kato, our colleagues, friends and visitors. It's my very great pleasure to introduce formally uh, Professor Paul Brunton. And I would like to add my words of welcome to Paul's uh, mother and to his sister who've travelled from England to be with us this evening and to visit New Zealand. So welcome to New Zealand, welcome to Dunedin, welcome to the university and welcome to Paul's inaugural professorial lecture. 
And also I'd like to extend my very warm greetings as well to, uh, to Ian Crabtree, Paul's partner. So Paul's professional history dates back to, to December 1984, which, by the way, makes him an exact contemporary of mine, I think, uh, when he was awarded his dental degree from the University of Leeds. His professional career started properly when he was a house officer in restorative dentistry at Leeds Dental Hospital in 1985. And later on, he had appeared as a general dental practitioner, which has been the grounding for many, if not most of us in the professional world, in Manchester during 1987, followed by registrar positions. Between 1993 and 1994, he was a senior dental officer in advanced conservation and prosthetics at the North Staffordshire Health Authority. And between 94 and 96, Paul was the clinical director of dental services at the Combined Healthcare NHS Trust, Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. Between 1996 and 1997, he was a senior registrar in dental public health at Birmingham Health Authority. And it was during this time that Paul gained his PhD from the University of Manchester in 1996. And the title of his PhD was Variations in Preparations for Indirect Tooth-Coloured Resin-Bonded Restorations. From 1997 to 2001, he was a clinical lecturer in restorative dentistry. That's when his academic career got going properly at the University of Manchester and an honorary senior registrar in restorative dentistry at the Central Manchester Healthcare Trust. And after a passage of time, and this is what Harleen referred to, in December 2004, Paul was appointed as a professor of restorative dentistry at the University of Leeds and as an honorary consultant in restorative dentistry at the Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Paul's research expertise is in clinical research, uh, particularly designing, conducting clinical research trials, and also in practice-based research within the general dental practice setting. He has published over 100 books, book chapters, referee journal articles, review papers, and so on. And his publication list does include work related to teaching and curriculum development. Uh, Paul's ha held many prestigious and important positions, including, for example, and this is by no means exhaustive, if it were to be exhaustive, we'd be here all night, but he was the clinical lead for the EDEN project, which uh, is a national project in the UK with a budget over, of over a million pounds. Um, EDEN is an e-learning resource for all members of the dental team, and I believe it has over 13,000 users. Uh, Paul termed, uh, uh, served a term as president of the British Society for Restorative Dentistry and also a term as president of the section of odontology of the Royal Society of Medicine. And as I say, the list could go on and on. He has had many important appointments. In addition, he has received many distinctions and fellowships, which similarly are too numerous to list here. Importantly, from our perspective, Paul was the academic lead for the recently completed uh, £9.5 million uh, Leeds Dental School refurbishment project. And of course, we valued that experience and background. So about a year ago, just over a year ago, in January 2015, Paul arrived at the University of Otago to take up the role of Dean of the Dental School. And I'd have to say that since then, he's been swept up in a maelstrom of incredible activity. And the projects are numerous, but they include, I'll mention two particular ones, which are very big and very challenging. Uh, the new dental school building project, with the, which the Vice Chancellor referred to. This is very, very complex, um, very uh, uh, detailed in its planning and execution. And I'm amazed every time I see Paul on the street or in my office or in his office looking calm and relaxed. Uh, the other major project which I will mention is called Digital Dental. And this uh, is another very large and complex project, uh, the objective of which is to bring chair-side radiography and also chair-side patient records 
uh, for every teaching chair in the dental school. And there are other projects too, which Paul's um, also leading in the dental school. My final comment is a personal one. So from a personal point of view, Paul is an excellent member of the Division of Health Sciences senior leadership team. And it's a pleasure to have him as a colleague. So on that note, I would now like to invite Paul to deliver his inaugural professorial lecture, which is titled, It's All About the Patients. Kia ora, uh, Tanakoto Kautor. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to see you all, and particularly thank you to the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellors, uh, and the Pro Vice Chancellor for the welcome that I've received. And can I just make a general comment before I start my lecture? The welcome that we've received in New Zealand has been amazing, uh, and thank you for that. What I thought I'd talk about tonight is a little bit about me and the type of research that I do, and then I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the research projects that we've been involved in over the last few years. And, and, and these are just examples of the things that we've been doing, which I hope are of, are of interest uh, to colleagues and, and people who are here tonight. So I want to talk very briefly about translational and practice-based research, because that's my interest. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Uh, and then talk about treatments for sensitive teeth, how you whiten your teeth, what you do with teeth that are decayed, what you do when some patients have no teeth and how we handle that, and then talk a little bit about uh, where that's taken us in translational research, looking at uh, how we manage the worn dentition. So just a little bit of a dip into all those particular areas uh, over the next 40 minutes or so. So for those of you who are not colleagues of mine, because they all know the answer to this, because I talk about it frequently, but for those of you who are not colleagues of mine, don't work in the dental faculty, just have a thought about why academic dentists, clinicians, good teachers get out of bed in the morning, and we'll come back to that question at the very end, uh, and I'll try and answer it for you. So for those of you who don't know the answer, think about that. So my theme is clinical benefit, because I strongly believe uh, I'm a very um, clinically focused academic in dental research, uh, and I always think about the benefit to patients and how we translate research that we do in the laboratory uh, and in various other departments within the dental school, how we translate that into a benefit to patients. Because if we don't do that, then we're missing the point, uh, would be my contention. So translational research, for those of you not familiar with the term, is research that results in products and services that benefit either or both patients and society, and that's very much the research space in which I aim to work. I have experience of practice-based research networks and very interested in practice-based research. And the reason I'm interested in that is that most dentistry is provided by general dental practitioners, 90% of it, arguably. Uh, and therefore, that's where I think research should be. And I think practitioners should be talking to us about the challenges that come from clinical practice to give us the research questions that we should try and answer as academics. So a practice-based research network is, is a framework that enables us to work with practitioners who we can train to do real-world research. Research done by practitioners on patients, we can generalize the results and the findings, and we can then translate that into benefits for patients worldwide. It's also a flexible route to get practitioners engaged in research and engaged with the dental faculty, and we then can reach out to the dental profession and community within New Zealand, and that's helpful in terms of what we can achieve together as a community. We have uh, the ARCH initiative within, within the faculty, and I'll mention that just very, very briefly. So we have a practice-based research network in the dental faculty cu currently that's called Achieving Research Through the Hands of Clinicians. And I'm very pleased to be able to be a part of that now and to add my interest and a little bit of expertise to my colleagues who are running that. And just very, very briefly, that's all about working with practitioners, doing research that's relevant to New Zealand, and I've learned very quickly that I have a lot of experience in the UK. You move to a new country and you have to change your thinking because things are not the same. And findings that will inform health policy and result in a benefit uh, to New Zealanders and, and internationally as well, which has to be our focus. And the one thing we have to work on is reducing the lag between research evidence coming to the fore and changes in clinical practice. And I'll come back to that a little bit later as a theme. 
So, if I may now talk to you a little bit about the research projects that we've been doing over the years. Um, again, they're all challenge-led, so these are research projects that have come from practitioners and patients asking us for evidence-based solutions that they can implement in their daily practice. So all of you will be familiar with sensitive teeth. So you bite into an ice cream, you get a sharp pain, have a cold beer, whatever, you get a sharp pain. And the treatment for that has always been, certainly in the UK, was the use of fluoride varnish. And we all really knew that it kind of worked for about two weeks, and then the pain would reappear, and people are nodding and they're agreeing with me, so they, they know the problem. So what we wanted to do was investigate whether there was, there was a more evidence-based treatment that produced a much more long-lasting benefit to patients. And so we conducted a clinical trial, and, and I've spent most of my academic life uh, doing clinical trials, looking at new treatments and interventions that might benefit patients. So for those of you who don't have any dental knowledge, why do teeth hurt? As we get a little bit older in life, we get some recession, the roots of the teeth become exposed to the mouth and the oral environment. And those little holes you can see here are dentinal tubules that open up. And as fluid or anything cold moves across those tubules, the osmotic effect of that change in temperature causes the tubules, the fluid in the tubules to move a little bit. And that just jerks the nerves connected to the odontoblastic cells here. And we translate that into ouch. And we think painful. So the challenge was how to effectively treat uh, sensitive teeth, or dentine hypersensitivity, as we might call it. And so we do a randomized controlled trial, which is a very rigorous um, structure for a clinical trial that eliminates as much bias and allows us to really focus on the research question so we get the answer to the question that we're trying to, to, to answer. So um, we did a randomized controlled trial. We randomly allocated three treatments to a group of patients. So a third of them get no treatment, which is always a bit challenging, because if you're in the no treatment group, you've still got the sensitivity and you're not getting any help. Um, a third of them got a desensitizing toothpaste, and I'll show you um, what that toothpaste was in a minute. And a third of them got a very fancy adhesive that has an antimicrobial in it that you could paint over those dentinal tubules and seal them up. So as the ice cream and the cold beer or the cold drink went past the dentinal tubules, you didn't get the sensitivity. And we wanted to see if the treatments would last for six months uh, because the current treatment, fluoride varnish, would only last for two weeks, which wasn't very helpful. So there's the fancy adhesive there produced by one of the dental supply companies. Uh, no surprise, we're using a Colgate toothpaste. And of course, the poor devils in this third arm of the study got no treatment and had to wait on the result. So interesting results. And I don't know how clear that is, but yeah, that's OK. So the, the, the special adhesive we were using uh, resulted in relief of symptoms in the vast majority of patients for periods of up to six months. So at six months, there was huge reduction in sensitivity. And the desensitizing toothpaste resulted in some reduction in sensitivity, but it wasn't long-lasting, and the reduction in sensitivity wasn't as great. And of course, the, the subjects on the control here, uh, no change in sensitivity during the period of the trial. So there's an evidence-based treatment. There's some evidence there to support that treatment based on a randomized controlled trial, and I would argue that dentists should be using that more and more in practice as a treatment for that. Uh, presenting condition. And what I always try and do is we write the scientific paper up because that's really important for PBRF and, and that's one of the metrics that we have in the university by which our research performance is measured. But what we also write is a, an article that in a magazine that dentists will read to try and get them to think about changing their clinical practice because that is a challenge. Now, if we look at, at this individual here who you might recognise, um, a long time ago... <coughs> He obviously had a lot of um, problems with his teeth, shall we say. And I want to talk a little bit now about whitening and some of the research we've done around tooth whitening. And I'll explain in a minute why I believe that tooth whitening is of interest to us. Um, obviously, that individual who, for those who don't know, that's Tom Cruise, went on to have a lot of dental treatment to rectify that, as you can see. Uh, and then went on to the middle years. We all have a middle age crisis, men included. And he reached the point where more orthodontics, and tooth whitening was carried out. So the end result was very, very nice. And if you look here, you know, there are, you see this throughout life. White teeth are associated with being more employable, being more attractive, being more confident. And people have orthodontic treatment, they have tooth whitening to achieve these results. Uh, 
Now, why am I interested in tooth whitening? Because that's the alternative, or it was until relatively recently. So we've got sound teeth here. This patient has no fillings in their mouth whatsoever but they're worried about their dental appearance, it's upsetting them, it's embarrassing them, it's socially handicapping them, which is important. And so they go off to see the dentist who picks up a drill, or a turbine as we would say, puts a diamond burr in that turbine and reduces those teeth and then sticks some porcelain facings on the front of them to achieve that result there. Now, I, I'm, I wouldn't be happy with that result. And I would argue there's an evidence-based treatment that you can use, i.e. tooth whitening, uh, to improve the appearance of those teeth without having to damage them. And that's the trick. You can improve the appearance of teeth now without having to damage them whatsoever. So we need an evidence base to that because it's a bit of a dark art. So we started to look and, and practitioners were coming to us with questions about what's the most effective way of whitening teeth uh, and what's the evidence base behind it. And there was no real evidence base whatsoever. So if you look at this picture here, you've got an individual in a dental surgery this is a very high intensity light. There's some high concentration bleach on those anterior teeth, the front teeth, and they sit for about half an hour. The teeth get very, very hot, but they become very, very white um, during that process. I decided, um, well, in talking to practitioners, that I wasn't convinced the light was doing anything. So we wanted to design a trial that would allow us to tease out whether actually having the light there made any difference. And this was the start of a personal journey, and we'll come on to the second leg of it in a minute. So, again, recruiting patients for whitening trials, very, very easy. Uh, but everybody wants white teeth. And, of course, the, the treatment effect is so great, the numbers you need in those trials is actually quite small. And they're still, the power of those trials is still very, very high. So we got 22 individuals and randomly allocated them to two groups. And... They all got the same treatment. The light was positioned there. The bleach was put on the teeth. But for half of them, we didn't turn the light on. So they'd lie there with the bleach on the teeth, but the light wouldn't be on. And we noticed, and our results at the end show, that there was actually no significant difference between the whitening effect we achieved with and without the light. And because of the heat that's generated by these lights, we worry about sensitivity. Uh, and so we measured that as well. So... If you look here, there's actually no difference in the whitening effect we, ch we achieved with and without the light. And the sensitivity levels were slightly different, but the difference wasn't significant. So that then answered in our minds the question about the light that we were testing. And I think you can translate that to other lights that are used in a similar way. Um, so then I asked the question, we then asked the question, well, if people have bleaching in the surgery with the dentist. It's very expensive. The dentist has to do the treatment. They have to lie in the chair for about 90 minutes. Um, if we do bleaching at home, is that as effective as having it done by a dentist? So the next question that we wanted to answer was, if we do home bleaching or home whitening, uh, can the result be as good as the dentist putting high concentration whitening products on your teeth uh, with or without the light, as it were? So another trial. Um, here we've got 36 subjects because we've got two concentrations of bleach and we've got a group that are going to have the light activated bleaching as well. So all of them have home bleaching, which is, if I just go back, is a tray that you place at night, usually at night. You put it, a bleaching gel in the tray, you wear it at night and you repeat that process for about two weeks and the effect on whitening is quite profound. So done at home by the patient. Here we've got a trial where we're looking at doing that at home on your own, just doing that, uh, doing it with um, in-surgery whitening with the light and different concentrations, as it were. And the net result, to cut to the chase, there's actually no difference. So the whitening effect that we achieved significantly was no different in all those three groups. So in my mind, we've answered the questions about do we need to use in-surgery whitening? Does the dentist need the fancy light? The answer to that is clearly no. Can patients achieve the same result at home under supervision? And the answer to that is yes. And here's one of our subjects here with tetracycline staining. Mercifully rare these days. Uh, tetracycline is a drug that's given for certain treatments. And if it's given when the teeth are developing, they develop stain and discoloration. So here we've whitened the teeth of the, the upper teeth of this individual, but we haven't treated the lower teeth. So if you ever go to Manchester in the UK, I come from south of that city in Cheshire, but if you ever go to Manchester and you see people with white upper teeth and dark lower teeth, they will be subjects who've been on our clinical trials <laughs> over many, many years because we never used to do the lower teeth. 
It's a bit sad, really. And we've published, obviously, the, the results of these trials over the years. So now, um, moving into a different space, another area of interest for me is, is tooth decay. And this is very significant tooth decay. And these are anterior teeth, um, permanent teeth, uh, adult teeth, uh, with significant levels of decay. And uh, for those of you who don't know, decay goes through many, many stages before it gets as, as significant as that. And, and we wanted to ask, answer a question as to whether we could do anything at an early stage to reverse the process. So I think of this as translational research. And I'll put these pictures in just to uh, talk a little bit about how research gets from the laboratory to the patient. Uh, and people often think of it as a pipeline. So if somebody has a bright idea in the laboratory, comes up with a new treatment for this, it moves through a, uh, a process of development, and then a treatment is actually uh, comes out of the other end that's of benefit to patients. And that's how we get new drugs, et cetera, for the treatment of heart disease, whatever. I, I think this is more of a circular pipeline. Uh, and certainly what, what happens is the process is as I've described, but once that drug's been treated on patients, it then goes back to the laboratory to see if further improvements can be made. So it's a constant cycle of improvement to improve the efficacy of the treatments that we're trying to develop. So uh, the question we were trying to answer here was can you cure decay, tooth decay, uh, dental caries as we would say, at the white spot lesion? And I'll show you white spot lesion in a minute so you'll know exactly what I mean. And many of you will probably have seen white spot lesions on your own teeth. And this came from work that was being done in bone defects where they were use self using a self-assembling peptide, I'll explain what that is in a minute, um, to, to heal bone defects. And we wondered if we could use it and translate that science to dental decay. So here we've got a white spot lesion. Uh, that's dental decay. So the very bad front teeth that you saw um, started off with a white lesion such as this. At that stage, the mineral loss, because that's what tooth decay starts as, it's reduction of mineral and removal of mineral from the tooth. It's reversible, so you can reverse the process at this stage. So we decided we'd run a clinical trial to see whether the, the treatment that we developed in the laboratory might have some benefit in this regard. So that's the structure of teeth, and it's a bit fancy, so don't worry too much about that. But it's calcium and phosphate make up the vast majority of the mineralized component of teeth. So it's a reduction in calcium and phosphate and loss of calcium and phosphate from the surface that causes uh, dental caries, starts the process off. So using self-assembling peptides, peptides are just proteins, uh, but if they can assemble together and form a structure that can attract calcium and phosphate to it, and you can get them to assemble in the defect in the tooth, then you can pull the calcium and phosphate in and in, in theory heal the lesion. And that's, what, that's our starting premise. So if you look at this diagram here, you've got a white spot lesion here on a, on a tooth there. If you look at that under the microscope, you'd see these little losses of mineral, the pores opening up on the surface of the tooth. If we could get our self-assembly peptide applied to that, could we get it to run into those pores on the surface of the tooth, form a scaffold, attract calcium and phosphate to it, form hydroxyapatite, and then seal up the tooth um, healing that lesion. So we took a, our initial trial, uh, 15 healthy adults uh, with white spot lesions. This was just to try the science out because we were just pushing the boundaries a little bit. After 30 days, there was a significant decrease in the size of the lesions and a shift from progression to remineralizing. And I'll show you some examples of some of the lesions that were treated in the study. This one here reduced in size at the top. The one at the bottom, you can see on baseline and further on, the lesion has disappeared. So these are sort of standardized photographs we have to take to demonstrate that. And that then translated into commercial products that are available today. So um, there's a treatment there for Curadont repair um, that's marketed by the company that uh, bought the licenses from the University of Leeds to translate this technology. Uh, and they've now produced Curadont Protect. And they're using the same self-ascending peptides to fill up those dentinal holes I showed you in the people with sensitive teeth uh, that then remineralizes and seals those up. And then the sensitivity reduces. The thing that fascinated me was that when the lesions healed, they healed the same color as the original tooth. So it was almost undetectable, which was amazing. 
So again, just another taste of some of the things we've done. Uh, for patients who have no teeth, uh, life can be very, very difficult, and the production of dentures for them can be slightly problematic. And one of the questions that we were interested in was uh, to make a denture, you need to take an impression. So you fill the tray with some impression material. For those who've had dental impressions, you know what it's like. It's not very pleasant. It can be unpleasant. It shouldn't be, but it can be. Uh, you have to take a mold, an impression and make a mold to then make the dentures on. And there was a question in our minds about what was the best material to make that impression from? And more importantly, did it affect the outcome, i.e. the dentures that were provided for the patient? <coughs> Because dentists make choices, they choose an impression material, it's based on personal preference, it's based on cost. But actually, was there a difference that we could tease out that actually affected the treatment outcome for the patients? Because if you're wearing dentures, functional comfort is everything. So you've got to be able to function, but it's got to be very comfortable. So that's an impression of the type that would be taken, and that's using silicone, which is a, a rubber-type material that we use to take on impressions. Uh, and in the UK at the time, alginate, which is another impression material that uh, is used widely in dentistry, was the material that might be used for that process. So this was a big trial that we did. We had 85 uh, edentulous patients that we identified in the UK, and we made all of them two sets of dentures. They didn't know which denture they were receiving first. So they didn't know whether it was made with the alginate impression or the silicone impression. And our outcomes were, what was the comfort for the patient? Could the patient pick up a difference that was relevant and measurable? And did the dentures produced with one material or the other material need more adjustments to make them comfortable? Uh, and what was the quality of life of those patients who got the dentures with one material or the other? So that's the structure of the trial, and I, I don't expect you to read that, but that's the lens we go to remove bias, focus down on the question of interest, and so patients would have dentures in different orders so that they didn't know uh, which was coming first, which was coming second. In fact, they didn't know until the end of the trial, and then they chose which was the most comfortable pair to keep and take away. There was no doubt about it. Significant evidence that silicone impressions make a difference, and... Uh, that's the gold standard in terms of impressions uh, for dentures, I think, the, today. Uh, the patients found the dentures more comfortable, they required fewer adjustments, and their quality of life was much better. Uh, and this was all measurable and significantly different than if they had impressions taken with the, the normal, uh, cheaper alternative material that would be available. Lastly, we'll talk a little bit about worn teeth. Uh, and then I'll conclude a little bit. And, uh, but here we've, we've got a patient who is um, in their early 30s. So significant tooth wear, and there's a reason for that. Um, that's a combination of reflux, that's stomach acid coming up into the mouth, uh, diet, and, uh, and various other things. But this patient came to us with significant concerns about their appearance. So worn teeth are a significant problem going forward. We're all living longer, which is fantastic. The quality of those added years are getting better. When I trained as a dental student and qualified in 1984, the anticipation was that most people would survive their dentition and that dentures would become the norm. Now, in the UK, that's completely gone now. So we're reaching the, the point where teeth are wearing out, which 30 years ago was never a consideration. But tooth wear now is a real consideration, uh, and there's a real treatment need. And to rehabilitate that patient, to give them back a functioning dentition took many, many hours to achieve that. So the treatment costs to provide that treatment are significant. And you can see the outcome there in terms of what we've achieved for that individual there. I started to have an interest in facial pain and um, myalgia, as we would uh, term it these days. And that's pain in the sort of temporalis muscle here and the masseter muscle here, which are the muscles that open and close the jaw primarily. And they're big, meaty muscles. You can feel your masseter muscle here and the temporalis muscle here. And I'll, I'll explain why this is related to um, tooth wear in a minute. Myalgia is quite common. So when we have exams on campus, students will develop symptoms and get a little bit stressed. And uh, it's temporary and it disappears uh, shortly after their examinations are passed and they relax and uh, those symptoms disappear. But the prevalence of this is quite high, nearly half the population. The other thing about living longer and um, retaining teeth for longer is the effects of tooth wear, as I say, 
start to build up. But if you're stressed, you grind your teeth. And you, all of us will, I'm sure, relate to this. And children actually grind their teeth significantly. But my practice has always been in adults. But um, bruxism, as we would call it, sleep bruxism or awake bruxism, people can grind their teeth during the day and be completely unaware of it. But most people would do it at night. And their partner would be very aware of it. Uh, and they would not be as aware of it. But the effects of that are quite significant. And if I, going back to our 30-year-old with the very worn teeth, we use things called stabilisation splints. These are splints, plastic bite guards, if you like, that we place on people's teeth that allow us to effectively position the jaw and allow us to provide uh, the, the rehabilitation, the treatment that we need to. But also they're there to protect the teeth from further damage. So if you grind your teeth at night, what we might do sometimes is give you an appliance to wear at night that makes sure you can't do any further damage to the teeth, which seems very sensible. Because many patients, when you talk to them, say, as long as it doesn't get any worse, I'm happy. So we would call on a splint like this. And then we were starting to get concerned because providing splints for the treatment of bruxism, grinding teeth, might affect um, obstructive sleep apnea in the sense that if a patient's got that or they're prone to that, inadvertently we could be making it worse by providing a treatment for just their teeth. And that's when we tend to think of the teeth and forget the patient. And this is about thinking about the patient and the consequences of the treatment that we might provide. So we designed a trial to try and tease out if patients were diagnosed with sleep bruxism, were they at more risk of obstructive sleep apnea? Because a dentist could walk into that, provide a treatment that actually could make the obstructive sleep apnea much worse. And that's significant. People fall asleep driving cars because of obstructive sleep apnea. So the effects are significant. So we got a sequence of patients coming through the Leeds Dental Institute and the Dental Hospital in Manchester, and we measured the risk of obstructive sleep apnea in patients with myalgia, patients with sleep bruxism, and also controls, people who didn't have either of those conditions. And the results were interesting. So there's a validated questionnaire that allows you to assess the risk of obstructive sleep apnea called the Stop Bang Questionnaire very simply filled out by patients in the waiting room before they come in uh, to see us on the clinic. So that was our tool for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And excessive daytime sleepiness is assessed using this questionnaire, which again has been validated. So we applied these questionnaires to three groups of patients to see what the results might be. And we were surprised because the sleep bruxism patients had a significant risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So if we were providing a treatment for that, we could in effect make that worse. And that just needs teasing out a little bit more. And patients with myalgia, discomfort in the muscles, uh, didn't sleep as well as they might do and had excessive daytime sleepiness, which was again significantly different than the, uh, the control groups. So that's an area that I am continue to explore with my co-workers because it's a fascinating area uh, that we want to probe into a little bit more. So what does the future hold for me? Uh, as I say, we're delighted to be here, uh, but I still want to do and be actively involved in research because that's why I joined academic dentistry in the first place uh, and it's important to me. Uh, and two of the things that we're focusing on at the moment, uh, we're looking at an antimicrobial filling material for the treatment of root caries in the elderly because that's you live longer, you retain your teeth longer, you get longer in the tooth, all those things are true you're more prone to root caries in old age, uh, and to find a simple treatment for that that could be effective is useful. Uh, and, and we're also working on a dental solution that can help with the management of obesity, which is very much out of dentistry, <coughs> but exciting. And, and one of the things I like about working here is the opportunity to collaborate and network outside the dental faculty with colleagues in, in other areas of the university. It's fascinating. So why do dentists, academic dentists, clinicians and teachers get out in the morning, get out of bed in the morning? It's a question I used to ask um, prospective dental students at the University of Leeds many, many years ago. And I used to get the answers, make loads of money, drive a flash car, um, because I have to. Uh, but actually, the reason we get out of bed in the morning is to work tirelessly in the service of our patients. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, it's very important to me. So thanks are due to many, many people who I can't name because I just don't have time to do that. This is just a spectrum of the people I've worked with over the years, some of whom I continue to work with. Um, they've been an amazing support to me, and I learn more from them on a daily basis than they learn from me these days, and I think that's a good thing. 
My family and my partner of nearly 30 years. With, sorry. Without which I would be nothing. Uh, and the many research subjects who've worked with us over the years in the clinical trials. Uh, I reckon we've had, I was trying to work it out last night, over 1,000, maybe 1,500 patients on all these trials over the years. Uh, it's important they help them contribute because after all I'm said and done, it is all about the patients. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much. And I'm one of the Deputy Vice-Chancellors at the University, and it's my great pleasure to thank Paul for his fascinating talk. I think we've whisked through a lot of dentistry that those of us who aren't dentists are very glad that we know about now, so thank you. Um, and, and in listening to your um, lecture, it's, it is all about the people, isn't it? It's all about the patients. And I, I think one of the roles of health researchers is to focus on research that will have clinical benefits to individual patients and the wider community as a whole. And Paul's lecture has highlighted to us how he's been able to do this in a variety of ways, how he's listened to the patients and also to the general de dental practitioners and been able to walk, work with them. And the importance of structures such as ARCH to facilitate that. He's also illustrated how researchers should work with patients, understanding what's important to them, why, they, why you need to um, qualif uh, train qualified practitioners and bring the gen general practitioners into the academic setting and work with them, um, and how it's really important that the research that we do is able to be translated to the chair side, I should say, not the bedside, shouldn't I? So, He's really also shown us the importance of teamwork because as you watched, looked at his slide, it was around groups of people working together um, and f facilitating this improvement to dental care. And he's also talked about how we need to think about what's happening in other fields of research that may not necessarily be directly in the area that we work in, but in, in allied fields, and thinking about how some of the, that research can be brought into our own field of research. And I guess um, the take home message really is that I've learnt that having a really good smile is important for life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, we'd like to give you a small token to, to remind you of this special day. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Helen. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Bless you. you. Thank you.